Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today, folks, we have Haig Arman presenting Designing and Creating a Social Book App Using Open Source Technologies. Haig is one of Canada's most respected and innovative digital designers. He has been designing brands, advertising, and interactive projects for 15 years. As a producer of CBC Radio 3's groundbreaking online magazine, Haig created editorial, design, and marketing strategies that have earned a die-hard audience. Haig is a founder and creative director of Lift Studios, and he holds a position as an assistant professor of design and dynamic media at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. I want to let you all know Haig will be speaking at our upcoming TOC, Tools of Change for Publishing Conference in New York on February 12th through the 14th. So if you have a chance, folks, do attend his session and make sure you stop by and shake his hand. We're excited to have Haig with us today to present this webcast for you all. As we get the program started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Haig. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Haig, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure he sees them for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you may need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And folks, today our hashtag is TOCCon, all one word. If you should have any trouble during the event, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have problems, please post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast and we'll have an archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Haig for his presentation. Hello, Haig. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm really happy to be doing this presentation for you all. Um, we've got a great number of people, um, from what I understand, from all around the world. So hello, everyone. I'm coming to you from Toronto, Canada, not my, my normal home. I live in Vancouver, and um, yeah, I'm attending a conference here, so I'm coming to you from a hotel room, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to running through the basic structure of what I'll be talking about in New York in a few weeks, and um, looking very much for your feedback in how I've structured this. I, My workshop that I will be presenting will be a little bit more hands-on, so I'm hoping people show up with their laptops and some software so we can actually um, get our kind of our hands right right into it. But um, what I'll be talking about today is um, uh, everything from the strategy, the design, and some development and decisions that move from one area to the other in these uh, and how these different areas kind of inform the overall experience of this book. Okay, so before I, I get into it, I'm just going to tell you a, li a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know who I am. I, as uh, Yaz told us, uh, am both the founder of a design firm in Vancouver called Lyft Studios, and right now I spend more of my time, uh, I'm concentrating on building an interaction design program at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Uh, and one of our large areas at the school is publishing um, both the print and uh, digital spheres. And I have spent a lot of time in the kind of more traditional communication design or, or print design area. I've worked as art directors for magazines and worked with publishers um, across Canada. 
So it's a, it's a world that I, I live in. I'm not sure how many of you out there come from a more traditional background in publishing, but um, I'm really happy to be part of the O'Reilly community to, to, to see, to experiment, and to, to talk about how we can move publishing forward. So, um, so one of my opening jokes uh, when I usually introduce myself is, uh, what do you get when you put a jazz guitar player and uh, an architect together? Um, and most of my students kind of get it. They, they, uh, I, the answer is, of course, an interaction designer. And um, for some reason, uh, those two former careers or uh, uh, endeavors have led me to be able to think about um, this new digital medium that we're working with in a, in a very holistic way, looking at it both from a creative standpoint as well as technical. So that's a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm going to move on to what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so what I'll, I'll be talking about, I've just got it listed out here. Um, so I, I'm curious to see what other platforms people are using uh, for for making publications, and I, I kind of zoomed out for a second to not just talk about books, but the the system that I'm going to outline for you guys is not just uh, for books, although I've I've focused it in the design to be more of a book-like presentation. But this system, I I would imagine it playing really well in the in the kind of more uh, periodical. Um, context as well. So if publications, if a magazine wanted to have more of a social feature in it, I think, I think this platform as, I, as we release it um, will, I, I'd like to see it used in that way as well. Okay, so I'm also going to be talking about the book as a social framework. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit further. I'm just going to go through our list so, so, you, so you can see that. Um, I'm going to talk. I'm going to try to make an argument about why to use open source tools to publish. Um, there are many proprietary things out there. I've done a lot of research to to sit down with users and and see what's working and what isn't working. So I'll share a little bit of that with you. And that um, related to this topic is this idea of native app versus web technology. I'm sure you've heard. If you, if you know anything about um, the area of digital publishing, this topic has come up a lot, and I have uh, my own perspective on it. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I have a workshop activity, which is introducing PhoneGap to you all. Um, it's, uh, I've had the, the advantage of living in the same city with the, the really talented team that came up with PhoneGap. So PhoneGap uh, is a open source project that comes out of a small company that um, that used to be called Nitobi that was bought by Adobe uh, last year, and so there's the team is still partly in Vancouver and, par and partly in in San Francisco, so I work quite a lot with the, that team um, mostly in a design capacity, but they they teach me a lot about how to hack through JavaScript, and so I'm very grateful for their help in helping me understand their platform more. Um, so I, I will, the workshop activity is, is basically um, a quick walkthrough of how it works. Uh, and then, um, you know, I've got the same, sorry, I've, I just realized I have the same bullet point twice. So I'll have to take that out. Excuse me for that. i move on to the next one. Um, balancing reading with social. And when I say social, we mean the idea of a social function or a fu some functionality that has to do with, with uh, commenting. Most, that's where we focused uh, our social. But um, what we found was that, that um, the social aspect in most publishing was really an afterthought. And so we wanted to give it just the right amount of attention. Uh, and we'll, so we'll talk about that from a design perspective. And then we'll jump into another kind of technical uh, exercise, which is to use jQuery Mobile. Uh, a really great JavaScript framework for taking H, um, really standard looking HTML and turning it into an app like uh, presentation. So we'll, we'll walk through that quickly. And then I'll introduce this idea of hybrid native, um, which is a term that I don't think a lot of people are using yet, but it's basically taking an, a native app and embedding web technology within it. 
So most people, the kind of the end user, the your audience, only sees a native app. They don't see that it's actually. They wouldn't. You'd have to look quite hard to see if it was <laughs> made with web technology. So I I really like this approach of hybrid and. Um, and so I'll talk about the benefits of why you might want to do a hybrid app rather than just fully native app. And then one of the really important things that we realized, we, myself and uh, a number of grad students that I worked with on this project, what we realized was that, um, that gestural affordances, and I'll talk about what a gestural affordance is for those of you that don't understand what that, those terms are. Um, we. Uh, we we realized it was a, a kind of a large barrier for us uh, as far as teaching users about intuitive interfaces uh, interfaces and how our, our typical book is the well the actual analog book as a metaphor is is something that we've used for so many years but as we reinvent it move it to the screen there are all these cues that people are expecting and so how do we how do we tap into those cues and use them in the digital platform in a way that's not heavy-handed. So that's my list. Um, if you take that list and you put it into kind of more topical uh, uh, categorization, you see that the, some of them fall under strategy, some of them fall under design specifically, and some of them fall under technology or development topics. And um, that will give you a sense of how I think uh, when I run my studio, I usually um, hire people that work in all of these realms. I, and I, I feel like instead of breaking teams down into strategists, designers, and engineers, I find that working with people that understand all of these realms and have maybe one area that they're, they have a strength in really um, makes the project much more cohesive, makes our team more cohesive as well. And so I will be jumping around from strategy to design. So please try to keep up or uh, at least ask questions. I do, I do tend to jump around, and, and I, I'm aware of that. OK, so here's how we got to this idea of a social book. Um, we, we, uh, we um, my, some, some colleagues at the school and a few students, we were asked to think about this idea of a social book. And it came to us by way of um, a project by Alex, Alexandra Samuel, or Alex Samuel, who is a, um, a really great kind of thought leader in Vancouver. She is um, a writer um, that last year was working at Emily Carr in the research office there, and also um, was um, hired as a blogger for Oprah and has been working on a few book deals, um, most of them digital books. And uh, one of her books was this idea of living online for, for her whole life, um, and uh, her generation being the first generation to have uh, online um, for most of their life. And so she wrote a, it's a, almost an autobiographical type book, but many of the chapters in fact, all of the chapters ended with questions. And so the book is very provocative. And, and the whole idea of the book was to instigate dialogue. And so we thought, if we're going to make a digital book for this, uh, uh, for this content, we need to make it flexible, expandable, something that will capture the, the conversation. So that's how this, this idea came about. Um, so the question that we asked ourselves as a research question, this was initially um, a research project, and um, that SSHRC that you see, if you're not from Canada, you probably wouldn't know that acronym. That's, uh, that's a SHRC uh, grant, so the government provides grants to Canadians to kind of push forward with research projects, and this was one of them. So our, our research question was, can reading a book be a participatory or social experience? And so, I mean, we focus this idea quite a lot. There are many ways in which a book can be participatory. And I don't think that adding social functionality to a book is a, entirely a, a new idea. But the way that we saw it is that we wanted to capture that 
all the discussion that happens around a book. If you think about some of the larger books of our of our time, there's at least as there's at least as much content around the book as there is in the actual original book. So think about how much dialogue happens online about a Harry Potter book. All of that stuff t is actually part of the book. If you think about the community as as in a larger sense as being part of that book. So we saw an opportunity to try to to try to build a book framework that would allow for people to to build a book uh, to, and capture the conversation within that book. Uh, and so our research outcomes was to create a prototype for this uh, social book, ebook, uh, and also find a way for those readers to contribute to the overall structure. Um, and so when I say that, uh, we don't want comments that are in a book to just end up in that one person's uh, book, but go into a larger back to the community. And how do we moderate that? There are many questions that came up. And so I'm just going to walk you through some of our questions that, that we tried to answer as we were building this prototype. And then we'll dive into the prototype itself. OK, so what are the issues of adding social, fu social functionality into the, a book format? Um, I, I would love, love to hear what you think those, those uh, issues are. I have some thoughts about that. Uh, so wh here's the two questions that, that came out of that. How can we design a vibrant dialogue around a subject that is captured into a single publication? But we wanted to know how to do that both in a design sense as well as how do we actually technically pull this off? Is there a way to do this? And then secondly, Will situations arise at this, when the social aspect of the book will overshadow the original text? So what happens when the conversation or dialogue around a topic um, becomes so large that it uh, overshadows the, that original text? We, these are questions that we wanted to answer, and the only way to actually answer that is by making a prototype and, and seeing how it contains the, this type of content. Moving on. Next question, can we integrate a social co uh, component into a book without getting in the way of the original content? That kind of came from that last question uh, that I just answered. And then how does the book itself become ultimately dynamic? Um, these are all different ways of looking at the same problem. What, what we're finding when we look at other examples of books that have social functionality built into them is that the, the commenting in a book usually is very secondary, and um, the way we like to put it, it's a bit of a pun, is that it's, it's marginalized. It's, it's content that sits to the side of the original content. Sometimes it's actually divorced of the original content, so it lacks context. And we were very aware of this as we were building and designing our, our app. We, we wanted to make sure that comments felt integrated within the original text. We actually have thought very hard about how those comments could could raise could be raised in stature. When I say that, how could how can we uh, approve a comment that's coming from the larger public? How to and how to have it um, become part of the original text? So if the author, in this case, it was Alex Samuel, if she saw a comment coming in about a specific chapter, she uh, and she thought it was a very important question she could flag that comment and then the book itself would frame that comment in a more prominent way. It would make it part of a, um, a kind of pull quote that's actually inside the main text and not comments being you know, completely um, separated from the book reading experience. So you'll see this in action in a minute, what, what our mock-ups at least look like and our prototype. Um, next question that came up was, what tools could we possibly use to, to, to manage our content, manage the comments? And of course, there's a membership registration. We w wouldn't want to just let people comment anonymously. We, we feel it's really important that, that you capture um, that information, the membership information as well. Uh, so we looked at a, a quite a large variety of different uh, commenting systems, you know, everything from 
the, or online forums and uh, to actual uh, mobile platforms. All right. Um, so yeah, what we found with with typical, I've gone over this quickly with the last questions, but what we found was that um, social usually means just sharing. So it's just an outward gesture from a book outward. So share it to Facebook, share it to Twitter. But there wasn't any sense of capturing those comments back in the book. And then the other one was, so in the Kindle kind of experience, you can make comments in the book reading experience, but they're very much private. And they're also, as I said, uh, kind of, um, you have to move to a different interface to read comments than the actual original text. And so we felt that that was, uh, took you away from the, the book reading experience. Uh, and that's, yeah, part of the, that third um, point as well. So I'm going to talk quickly about the technology w that we chose to build this. Um, my kind of crude diagram shows uh, how we kind of stack the technologies up. So starting on the bottom, we have WordPress as our content management system. That's a CMS part of it. Um, I, I don't I'm not sure if I need to talk much about WordPress. I think I'm, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with WordPress as a platform. It's an open source, um, re, um, really robust yet small content management system. Comes from the blogging environment and now kind of a, one of the primary technologies that, that people are using to publish websites. Um, so I'm very familiar with WordPress. My studio does a lot of websites um, where we start with WordPress as our kind of foundational technology and then we build on top of it. And um, so we use that, but nobody ever sees WordPress in our book. WordPress is just this um, kind of cloud service. We basically, if we were able to make our own cloud service, we would, but WordPress was a very easy way for us to have a, a content a repository somewhere up in the internet that the book would be able to request information from. So those arrows that you see above that first stack, the WordPress stack, is a JSON API. I'll explain what that is. Um, those are, you know, as most technology folks love using acronyms. Uh, JSON is a JavaScript, actually, Maybe someone can help me out. I don't actually know the acronym's full definition, but JSON is a format, a format specifically in XML that um, is quite lightweight and easily uh, moved back and forth across the web, um, becoming quickly becoming a standard way of sending content. Uh, so it's a structured uh, data system, and an API is applic application protocol. Uh, interface, which is basically the way I describe this to my students, is that it's it's a backdoor to a web service. So, in other words, it's a way of pulling or um, either requesting content or pushing content back to a service. It's a way of getting content from a, a CMS without actually going to that website. So, this is what we do. We uh, we use this JSON API. Um, to, let's call it a tunnel for now. It's, uh, it's this invisible tunnel that the user, I'd say it's invisible because the user doesn't see this happening. It kind of happens behind the scenes. It grabs content from WordPress and then it shows it in the application. And so if, the, if anyone has any comments to add, it will, it will seamlessly grab new content and bring it into your application. So if you have any questions about that, please, please feel free to ask. Um, and I'm going to show you what that looks like in action soon. So the next layer up is our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript layer. That's standard kind of web technology stuff. And it's basically used to grab the content from WordPress and structure it in a, in a way that's presentable in, an, in a mobile app. Um, I think that's all I need to say there. Moving on, we have another kind of invisible tunnel system, which is the web technology gets embedded into the native app framework. And so I left that top box. I, I called that native application. It could be iOS, as in the iPhone platform. It could be Android. 
It could be so PhoneGap boasts, I think, seven platforms uh, that you can you can publish to, and that's one of the larger benefits of using PhoneGap is instead of having to write your application in a number of different languages, you can write it in your standard HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, uh, contain it within a PhoneGap app, and then publish to multiple platforms. So this is um, goes without saying, it's, it's a really affordable and great way to be able to publish if you want your, your, uh, your presentation to look, sta um, it, to look consistent across a number of platforms. All right, I'm going to quickly show you what this, the mock-ups of this book look like. So our working title for the book is 50 Years of Life Online. Um, this is the cover for it in the iPad format. Uh, we also designed it in a way that it would look great on a phone as well as a tablet. So, and I, I'm very curious to see um, what your comments are about that as we as I show you the the application just in flat screens. Um, we do have a prototype that that moves back and forth between these on the actual uh, app. But we, I, I'm curious to know if if any of you are designing uh, book apps that that work only in the iPhone or in the iPad? Or would you come up with two different books, one for each size, or do you have one size that fits all? We found that, um, that things like buttons or, or sliders, uh, when you, when you make, design them for the tablet experience, th it doesn't work across the iPhone either. So you have to resize things. Um, have to think more of a more like you're designing a responsive website. So it has, things have to scale. Uh, so there's the cover page. Um, right in the middle um, of the title, you see there's a, a, a little interesting uh, dev design device that we used, and um, and this this was um, a. A, a cue for the user to actually pinch to open the book. And so this metaphor of, of opening up a piece of paper by pinching it open is the main metaphor that we play, that we use, and it plays across the whole book. So we, we wanted to in introduce this idea of a, ge of, of a gesture as the way to navigate through the book. Um, so you can see it there. It's to your, to your right. Uh, to just the right of the title, and those little arrows signify, you know, move one hand, one finger up, one finger down, and it would split open to give you a table of contents that looks like this. And so the book's content was separated by decade and uh, color coded, so each decade had its own its own. Uh, um, uh, pattern system. It had these subtle cues that, that showed you that you were in different parts of the book. And then you can see that same little uh, design motif that tells you to, to split apart the decades to open it up and dig deeper into the content. So if you look here, um, and, and if you're wondering where we got this idea of using kind of the pinch gesture as part of the navigation, um, you're starting to see now, especially in the in the iPhone world, you're starting to see gestures play play out in a, a number of kind of interesting ways. One of the one of the apps that we were really fond of is the app Clear. Um, it's an interesting name because it's it, it, most people don't remember it, but it's a to-do list app called Clear. I think it's uh, I, I imagine it's a dollar. Uh, it's a very colorful app that just gives you a very quick way of making a list of things to do. But it's all gestural. I recommend downloading it and, and having a look at how, how to use that. It's, it's, I, I find it's quite easy, and most of the people I've, I've introduced it to have, have loved it. There's something about using gestures that make something a little bit more tactile. and. Uh, and th and that's really when you when you interview people that are using digital books, that's one of the things that they miss the most is that tactility of a book. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that people didn't lose that sense of tactility, and that's why we kept this idea of using your fingers on the pages or uh, on the screen to to move in and out of content. So this is decade view. If you were to 
pinch to open it up, you would move to, so I'm, I'm, I'm showing you the next screen now, which is uh, what the 80s screen looks like. And if you navigate it into this decade and it w happened to not be the decade you wanted, you can, you can s um, squeeze the whole decade and it would go back to, so I'll just, it would go back to the, this, this view. The, uh, the, so you'd see multiple decades in one screen. Uh, again, so reverse pinch uh, to open into or dive into content and uh, a regular pinch to close content and move out of the structure, moving up a layer. hope that's clear. Okay, so at this level you see the articles listed out. Um, and of course you're seeing the text there, it's just saying a tagline for the year. Um, this is mock-up that, that had you know, basic lorem ipsum like dummy text in there, but we would, we would fill those in uh, with actual titles of articles. And once you reverse pinch or uh, uh, to open one of these, you would go into the article level itself and there's, you can see an article uh, I think what you're seeing there is actually a scroll down if you're not getting that very top of the article in this screen gra grab. So, and you can see that it's more of a text text experience, but there's quite a lot of images in this Alex Samuel book that have uh, pull quotes and um, photo captions. So we try to keep it as as visual as possible, This the, the way this was mocked up. So that's the 50 years. That's just a quick preview of the book that we'll be launching, I think, within about three months. Uh, and uh, I, Alex Samuel, I, I, I'll let her talk about when she, <laughs> she, she'll she want to launch that, but it, it will be soon. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, so just in the sake of time, we're already at about half an hour into it, and I, I want to... Uh, I probably won't take the time today to walk through each one of these workshop ideas. I, I want to leave something for the conference in New York. So uh, is it, I'm not sure if anyone that's joined us today is thinking of attending. I hope some of you do. Uh, we'll be walking through these three examples one by one in, in my workshop. Um, and I've, I've got links here. In, there, well, I've also talked about releasing this PDF uh, for you to download and go through it yourself, um, but I won't be doing that until the, the T TOC conference in a few weeks. I think it's the, the 14th that I'll be speaking. So ex expect a link coming out. You can either get it through um, O'Reilly Media or I'll be also publishing it through my Twitter stream, Hey Garmin. So yeah, the, this first assignment, or assignment, <laughs> this first uh, exercise is just uh, a quick, quick and dirty, very quick uh, way of familiarizing yourself with PhoneGap. Um, and you can see a link at the bottom of that, so those slides. Moving on, um, so I talk a little bit about what, what are the requirements, what do we need to actually be able to publish PhoneGap to uh, the app format, so you'll need Apple's Xcode and Xcode uh, can be found at developer.apple.com and PhoneGap is a free download from PhoneGap.com. Uh, I think Apple works quite hard at trying to get people to sign up to a developer license for Apple. You can get around um, to using Xcode without getting a developer license. You just won't be able to publish your apps to a device. You'll be able to just publish them to your desktop and see them in action in the iPhone simulator that comes with Xcode. So uh, yeah, so a few little barriers to actually publishing straight to um, the App Store, but uh, not a huge barrier. I think that the developer license is $100 and has been for the last three three years, $100 a year. So it's I think it's a pretty reasonable thing to ask. Okay, so what else do you need? Um, yeah, so I went went over the developer certificate and Xcode. All these things are pretty widely available online. I've, I've given you some links there in that slide. 
Um, then I quickly walk through the the publishing of a phone gap app. I'm just going to walk you through these fairly quickly so I can get to the next examples. This shows you what the screens are. Uh, when you first try publishing, then you have to kind of shuffle, do a little bit of a shuffle with your files, and let the this we're looking at the Xcode interface now in the slide, um, and you'll have to manage that by adding a www folder to your app structure. You see that there. Um, it'll ask you to contain it within the project. Just going to quickly go over here. And then when you publish the app the next time, you'll see this. Hey, it's Cordova. Cordova is kind of a phone gaps um, code name for the, its open source uh, project. Uh, yeah, they wanted to make a distinction between phone gap and Cordova. One of them is, is a, a, an Adobe product, and the other is more open source and owned by Apache, or managed by Apache, not owned. Okay, so my next example is um, using jQuery Mobile. I'm not sure if anyone out there is familiar with jQuery Mobile. It's uh, a, a really um, solid framework for making, uh, taking web technology and kind of transforming it into the, an app-like structure. And so my next example, I'll just quick, quickly walk you through some code that will turn your web page into more of an app structure. The first thing I have highlighted there is the meta tag viewport, which will resize your content to fit appropriately within a mobile device. And I'm just going to jump through this stuff fairly quickly because I just uh, want to make sure we have time for uh, questions and answers. Um, so embedding a, a CSS file within your structure Moving on to, first you need jQuery itself, so the, the larger JavaScript uh, framework library. And then on top of that, you need jQuery mobile. And so just pay attention to the, the versions that you see here. Uh, when I made this presentation, um, I used 1.8.2 for the jQuery and also 1.2.0 for the jQuery mobile. Um, I didn't really want to get too deeply into the versions, but I found that the latest, very, very latest jQuery doesn't seem to work with the current jQuery mobile, so you might have to start at the, these versions that I'm, I've given you here, and then upgrade slowly. Uh, and then, so the next thing I want to draw your attention to is, is kind of this HTML structure that you see. So the area that's kind of highlighted with the green is, um, this div structure, so it's a typical div HTML structure, one of them being a container for the page. So it has this uh, special tag called a data role, and that's something that jQuery Mobile uses as its kind of container. So it uses these little objects as ways of containing content. So within the page container, we have a div with a data role of header, and that's it, obviously a header. Within that is a title. And then there's a main content area, and we can also add a footer to that. So um, the next part of my example is uh, to see how lists look. I mean, if you look at uh, typically look at the way a lot of apps work, you do get a lot of list st structures. So navigation uh, usually works in lists. And so um, this is a great quick example that shows you what lists look, look like in the jQuery world. Um, I'm not sure if I included, a, I didn't include a slide of what that looks like uh, outputted. So I'll, I'll add that later before I publish it. And then the last part is uh, how um, a slider might work. And so jQuery has dealt with this. It takes that standard HTML uh, with the ID of slider and the type of range, type equals range. There you can see that under input. And it actually converts that into a very typical looking slider that you would see in, in iOS. And if you were to publish into 
the Android format, it would it would convert that into a standard slider in the Android world. So it, what I love about this is it just completely will transform and start using um, interface elements that are kind of native to that the the mobile format that you're in that you're publishing to. Okay, moving on. So uh, the the next example was um, was to quickly make a multi-page document within jQuery and show you how you can move from screen to screen. And it's uh, another thing that we can do very quickly in using jQuery. So there's you can see uh, so some links here on this slide, or just one link actually. Uh, going to the jQuery mobile uh, documentation, which gives you some really great, easy to use examples. And then I want to talk quickly about gestural affordances um, and then kind of summarize. So, quickly, what we found as we were designing this book and actually moving it from being you know, a mock up into a prototype is we found that people really need strong cues to know how to use gestures. Um, we, we have all kinds of cues. I want to say Q. Um, an affordance is uh, when a piece of design conveys how it should be used. Um, and a good example of that is when we see a button on the screen, we get a sense that that button is clickable. We know that we have to actually move our mouse over and click to to get an action out of that that button. In the mobile world, we don't. We tend to move. Aw we're, we're moving away from buttons. Um, in the mobile world, there is no such thing as a hover state, so you can't hover, put your finger over a button, and see the hover state. Uh, your finger would cover up that hover state anyway, but there is no hover state when you touch down on the screen that registers as a click, and you move to the next action. So these are really interesting. Um, Things is uh, we've found that that we need to suggest what the what that gesture is, um, whether it's a two finger gesture, or a three finger gesture, or just one finger moving in a specific direction. We need to visually show users how to move their fingers over an interface before they do it. So um, these are basic provocative questions that I, I don't feel like we have answers for. The only answer I have is a designer answer, which is it depends. <laughs> and it depends on the context normally and our users. What kind of users do we have? Are they familiar with gestural interfaces or are they not familiar at all? If they are, f are not familiar, as most book readers are not familiar with gestural interfaces, we need to make um, ways of making that interface easy easy to use by maybe providing small short animations of how something might might work before someone actually does a gesture. So an example I can come up with really quickly is in that initial, uh, let me just hop back to my title page. When we did a little bit of user research and I'm just going to push you back to that. So with that title page, you can see on that right side we have those two white arrows. Uh, when we did a little user research, we found that those arrows, I think people just saw them as a pretty pretty part of the design, <laughs> the cover page, and didn't see them as something that you can use. Um, it's just this nice little design thing. Um, and they didn't see it as a button. And so what we started doing is we played with animation. So those arrows started moving um, subtly, just moving and catching your eye every once in a while. Uh, and that was enough. Just a tiny little animation was enough to get people to start moving their fingers and 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 uh, using that. And as soon as they started doing that reverse pinch, they quickly moved into the book, and were easily able to understand how to how to navigate through the book after that. So it's a, we have to be inventive. This is kind of new ground here when it comes to um, providing these affordances for for gestures. And so that, I think, is all I want to go over. I've been talking for 40 minutes. Um, not sure how you guys are feeling, uh, but I would love to hear um, to try to answer some questions for you. Uh, and then the, the only thing I, uh, the only other part of 
the presentation that I haven't covered here is so the next part of my presentation is, sorry, uh, lost myself in my slides. The very last bit is the JSON API. So um, basically making WordPress act as a as an API. There's a there's a ton of plugins out there. There's there's um and I'll I didn't publish any links on this slide, but I will find you a few because there's a number of JSON API plugins out there. Some of them are more tested than others. But you basically uh, install them, and then you can, in your JavaScript, you can call these APIs and pull content from WordPress. Um, and that's, yeah, that's really um, all I was planning on doing. Not all. It's, it's a good, it ends up being at least an hour and a half if you go through all these examples. Uh, and I walk through some of the JavaScript and explain it and how it works. And that takes me to about 45 minutes. And thank you. That would be my presentation, and I would love to hear what your questions are. So please fire away in the chat box, and I, I will do my best to answer them over the next 15 minutes. Super. Hey, thank you for such a fascinating and outstanding presentation. We have a lot of questions coming Great. in, as you can imagine. Folks, we are at Q&A, as you heard. If you hadn't opened that group chat widget, do open it, type your question in, send it in, and Haig will answer as many as we have time for. Um, and with that, Haig, I'll ask, are you able to see the questions in that Q&A tab? I am. I'm looking. So I'm, I, I, do you want me to start from the top of the list? Um, as you wish. Okay. So I've got Philip S. Um, asking about, is there a link for the JSON API? I, I mentioned it right at the very end there that I, I am planning on providing a link for the JSON API. Um, I, I apologize for not putting one in. Uh, now and that was the reason for it as it didn't want to mislead anyone there is um, a very standard JSON API if you just search for JSON API in WordPress you will find it's the first thing that comes up it's the one that that people have rated really highly in the WordPress um, plugins area and it's it is is a solid plugin but I found that there's another one that I, I haven't provided that link I don't know it offhand um, and I will include that in my slides that is there's a little bit more customizable and you'll be able to pull um, uh, let's say more atypical content from WordPress so I will that will let, I'll try to circle back with you Philip and, and make sure that you get that link so moving on Ashley a asks uh, could comments in social books be erased um, so you could start a book from scratch. Um, thinking of how how neat this concept would be for academia. Yeah, absolutely. I've totally thought about that too, Ashley. And uh, as a prof, I've I want to use this framework um, to to make my own textbooks um, because my students um, uh, normally as they as they move through their program, they they start becoming um, you know. They move from being a consumer of content to actually being a contributor quite quickly. Um, so to answer that question, um, you would be able to manage comments in the same way that you can manage comments in WordPress. So the way Alex, Samuel, and I have been working on this project is we, we had students comment on her book as she was writing it. and. Um, she was able to, if someone was, you know, asking not appropriate questions, I'll put it nicely, uh, she was able to go into the WordPress, log into WordPress, and moderate the comments by either depublishing them, you know, to deleting them, or just taking them out of, uh, out of, out of circulation. So yeah, the you can they can be erased. They can, they can, we didn't think about that functionality in the application itself. We didn't feel that, that was um, relevant to where we were in our pub, uh, our prototype. But that's a great question. Moving on, more questions. Gail Evans has asked, uh, how would you moderate store comments? Um, I think I just answered that. Uh, it all happens within WordPress. So, and WordPress, you can hide. So it's it lives on on a website. Not, I and I, I should be clear here. We're not using WordPress.com. We're using WordPress.org's 
software and installing it on our own server. So your book has a server component. And not only a server component, but your book becomes a database. So there's an online database that contains um, the book and the comments and any members that have been commenting. So that's where that all lives, up in uh, a dedicated WordPress service. Uh, on to the next one. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to corre uh, correctly pronounce Tony's last name, but it's C-A or Hsie, H-S-I-E-H. Uh, oh, sorry, H-S-I-E-H. Yeah, that's right. So what's the difference between PhoneGap open source and PhoneGap Adobe? Is there a difference? I, I've tried to answer this question. I'm clearly not qualified to answer this question. Um, what I know about this is that so PhoneGap itself is, is bought by Adobe and Cordova, which is the open source implementation of PhoneGap, is owned by or managed by Apache. Uh, and there is no the, so the PhoneGap team before they were bought out by Adobe were very adamant about keeping PhoneGap open source, and that's why they they um, procured uh, Cordova as an Apache license, and so it's it, you can use it. In um, all you have to do is follow their GPL license. I'm, uh, I think it is a GPL license. I, I don't want to speak out of turn there, but I'm pretty sure it's GPL. But um, yeah, the, so if you're wondering about whether PhoneGap is at some point going to not be open source, that I would have very little to worry about there. I think it's very much uh, um, uh, going to stay open source. Okay, next up uh, is Slim Slam <laughs> has said. Um, did you look at other cross-platform tech like Sencha, Titanium, Trigger, Accelerator? I have, yes. I've looked at all of these, and uh, I think some of them are really great. I think both Sencha, uh, Sencha Touch, and Titanium, uh, um, from what I've spent, I've spent quite a bit of time looking at those. They're very robust systems. But they they weren't as open source. They uh, they they had kind of proprietary parts of them that made me. The other part of it is accessibility. I want my little social book project to um, to be released as its own open source project, uh, and I will be releasing it. I hope very soon. And um, and so I can't. Sencha's license is that you can't take Sencha and publish it as your own. <laughs> Um, open source project, but I have used Sencha for many projects, and I think it's an uh, amazing platform. Um, its benefits, well, I can speak m more to Sencha than the other ones that you've mentioned here. Uh, it, its performance seems to be smoking fast. The Sencha uh, apps, and both both uh, the animations and transitions, things like that, seem to work incredibly quickly in the Sencha platform. Um, not to say that you can't get things working quickly in PhoneGap. Um, I was in my examples. I've tried to keep them as simple and accessible as possible. But you know, for example, um, one version of my social book we decided not to use jQuery Mobile because jQuery Mobile is quite heavy when it comes to a file size, uh, and uh, the the mobile browser can can slow down a little bit. When it's when it's digging through most of that JavaScript, so we've we've used things like Zepto.js, which is um, um, very much like Java uh, jQuery Mobile, but um, but specifically for the iOS uh, platform. I uh, hope that answers your question somewhat. On to the next question, uh, Deacon Brown. Uh, he's got a question about. Uh, I've heard the transition animations JavaScript and CSS can be a bit choppy through PhoneGap compared to the native. Is that true? Uh, are you using transitions with a pinch gestures? Yeah, good, great, really great question. Yeah. So yes, this is this is partly true, and we're working through this. Um, yes, uh, uh, CSS animations can become a little bit choppy when uh, it, it's not PhoneGap's fault. It's actually 
Um, when you're using PhoneGap, it's actually taking a Safari browser and embedding it within uh, your native app. You just don't see any Chrome, so you don't know you're in an app. Uh, you, you don't know that you're in a browser. So, um, so it's really up to what they do with the WebKit implementation in the mobile world. Um, as it gets better and, and as uh, CSS animation and transitions um, are rendered um, better, then we're going to see less and less choppiness. So, um, so, so that's why I was I was all right with this temporary solution of being a little bit choppy, and um, I, we're trying to work towards optimizing. You know, making making any graphics as small as possible seems to make a huge difference. Um, also, you know, not doing 3D transformations, things like that. That our pinch gesture has some 3D transformations um, to to um, emulate this idea of folding paper, and so that's pretty uh, processor intensive. And we're so we're working towards optimizing that at this point. That's why I haven't really shown you anything because it's not as sexy as I want it to look. Um, yeah. So that said, um, so these are all uh, really valid concerns that you have, Deacon. Um, but also, I think that we're we're looking at a window here of some time where these are all fairly cu cutting edge technologies, and as they become a little bit more mature, we'll we'll see much l less of a problem with the uh, um, performance. Okay. Next, Matt Kirkland has asked, uh, "Is this book available now?" Unfortunately, not. Um, we um, so Alex Samuel is working on the. The content part of it still. Um, I'm working with my small team in Vancouver, kind of off the side of our desk, to to make sure our, our prototype is publishable. Um, I don't have an uh, an ETA on on that yet, but um, like I said, we're hoping for. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing by the summer we'll have something that's uh, ready for public. So yeah, please keep. Um, Keep your ears open. We'll be we'll looking forward to hearing what everyone's feedback is. Um, so next we have uh, Miles Harrison ask what size are the books uh, resolution? And so uh, this is a really great question. Uh, and I quickly breezed over resolution when I was talking about different uh, different platforms. So how does the book look on an iPhone versus an iPad versus an Android tablet? All of these have very different sizes. How do you design for this? So what we did was we started with the typical um, iPhone 4 size or 4S uh, and we worked outwards to to the iPad and made it. we did a high resolution version for the iPad and um, we're not quite at that point where we've got all the detection. So when we know that we're in one tablet, we'd get rid of certain images. I think at this point, because all of the images get packaged within the app, so you download the images with the app, um, we don't have to worry too much about file size when it comes to, because really when you're, we're looking at developing a book, the, unless there's video or audio in that book, um, the heaviest files are going to be your high resolution images so that's that was our largest concern at that point so we made them 300 dpi uh, and they're all squeezed down into jpegs using uh, fireworks so um, yeah I, uh, because the images are all different sizes depending on which articles you're talking about um, I don't have the file sizes offhand. They, they vary quite a lot. But um, I hope hopefully answered your question about resolution. I'll move on to the next question here. Uh, so what platforms does PhoneGap support? Um, yeah. Uh, the last time I looked, it was seven platforms. Uh, the, the three big ones that they are really concentrating a lot on are the, are the, the ones you'd expect. Uh, iOS, obviously, Android I mentioned, and and the Windows platform. So all the, those three, as well as uh, the last time I looked, it was working in the Palm OS as well as 
do, do, do. I should know this. Maybe I'll just hop over to the PhoneGap site and have a quick look there. Give, just give me one second. Okay, well, hey, you're looking that up. I just want to remind folks that our TOC conference, Tools of Change for Publishing, is going to be held in New York, February 12th through the 14th. And we do invite you to visit the TOC Con website, pushed out information to you all in your group chat about that. There is still time to save on your registration, so take advantage of that savings. And if you like what you saw and heard <laughs> Haig talking to you about today, you do want to attend his session because he's going to have the live workshops where he's really going to go into lots of good detail for you. So judging by all your questions, that is something you folks need to attend. It's really going to benefit you in your day-to-day. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Haig. <laughs> Thanks, Yaz. Uh, so quickly, I can answer the, the platform uh, question. So I'm looking at uh, uh, under the features area of PhoneGap.com, you can see that they now are publishing to eight platforms. So the iOS platform, well, actually, so they have two, <laughs> two for iOS. Uh, I guess there's a 3G and 3GS. Android, both, both flavors of BlackBerry. So um, OS 5 as well as OS 6. The web OS, the Windows Phone 7 format, Symbian, and Bata. So, and I imagine they're going to move on to the new, I don't know how much you guys know about the new uh, uh, Ubuntu uh, mobile platform, but the, um, I've, there's already talk. I've talked to a few of those folks about them moving it to that platform as soon as they can too. So, uh, yeah, I think it's one of their... their um, their selling points is, is uh, or their unique <laughs> identifiers is that they, they are going to support as many platforms as they can. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. There's a, there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm almost through all these questions, so uh, hold on. I'll try to get through everything. So Dom M asks, is security, authentication, encryption uh, an integral part of the framework, or is an implementation dependent on device iPhone, Android being used? So that's a really great question and something that uh, we, we pushed off. There's a lot of complexity in, in trying to do that um, in a uh, cross-platform way. We, what we did was we, for now, we left the encryption or authentication up to WordPress. Um, and we have, um, I think we put on a Facebook or Twitter log in with Facebook or log in with Twitter. And I understand that's not for everyone, but for purposes of our of our uh, our prototype, we felt like it was the, the quickest b uh, barrier, uh, the way of getting getting over that barrier of not having people type in a new, um, registering a new account. Um, uh, so we just had a log in with Facebook, which we did through WordPress, and that worked quite easily. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's a quick solution, I know, but um, it seemed to work. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll move on to uh, in our as we move forward with the prototype, we'll we'll decide whether we're going to um, um, uh, try to manage all the membership through WordPress, or is it perhaps there might be a um, a bottleneck with that. Um, the way I work is I usually build as and think as we go. <laughs> if I start seeing bottlenecks, we'll we'll move um, into making new technologies. But that I hope that answers your question about authentication. Next up, um, Matthew asks uh, via Twitter. He says, uh, c "Can we integrate a social component into a book without getting in the way of the original content?" So I, that's just I think he he took one of my questions and tweeted it out. <laughs> That's one of my questions in my, uh, and yeah, I I put it in my presentation as a kind of a rhetorical question. There are many ways to answer that question. I feel like our prototype is one way of, of answering that. And then on the uh, on the note of periodicals, Philip S asks, um, how would you compare this to something like uh, Adobe uh, Adobe's DPS? So the digital publishing suite that Adobe uses that. There's a number of us that uh, that work um, at my school at Emily Carr um, using the DPS 
system. Uh, it, it is a really great system. It's very much from a print perspective. You know, basically, it's in design, <laughs> uh, publishing to a digital platform. And what I've found is that the apps that it makes are huge in file size. And um, so this is an important point. Um, and, and I think it's going to be my closing point, is that uh, um, even though uh, we have incredibly fast connections all around the world now, um, what I've found is that um, when it comes to things like periodicals, like, like magazines, uh, when you look at the reviews that these magazines are getting in the app stores, it's, it's pretty appalling. There, there are barely any that get anything uh, uh, above a two star, and I'm talking about you know Oprah's magazine or um, sorry to sorry to harp on Oprah, but uh, um, also the Wired magazine, which and the and the most of the reasons are they take too long to download. So these magazines come in each month at over over 200 megs, uh, and that's a huge point. They're uh, they're really uh, um, as something that can actually be fixed quite easily, but um, people aren't aren't uh, the the people that are publishing or authoring these magazines aren't aren't they, they've never been in the habit of thinking about file size. Why would they? They've been printing to 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 paper, and uh, when we're pushing things through digital pipes or wirelessly, we um, so we um, people that think about um, the digital. <laughs> the, uh, thinking about pushing content through digital means, uh, we're, uh, we've never had the luxury of not thinking about that pipeline and how we move content through that pipeline. So we're constantly thinking about how do we optimize content so it moves over the airs as fast as possible. So the, the DPS system doesn't really consider that, doesn't really do a very good job of optimizing, and so you end up with these really, really huge files. And animations are, are also very basic. Um, so for that reason, I think it's a really great, um, fast way to get publications into the digital space. So there is a place for it. Um, I just want to quickly move beyond that. That's, so that would be my answer is that um, it, it serves a purpose right now, but I think it's, a, it's got a window, <laughs> a life, um, uh, yeah, you know, a, a pretty limited life in, in the world of digital publishing. So I just want to summarize. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Uh, I've had a good time just running through this. Uh, and I've got some notes of my own about you know, how I'm going to pace this properly so, so that I've got the right amount of um, kind of hands-on exercise as well as kind of more of the tr strategic stuff. Yeah, if you have any other questions you want me to answer, please uh, shoot them off uh, into the Twitter sphere or through um, through um, uh, come see me at the conference if you're going to come. I'd love to meet you in person. Thank you. Perfect. And with that, folks, we're going to say a very big thank you to Haig for presenting such an outstanding webcast for us all today. Thank you, Haig, for sharing your knowledge and expertise. You're welcome. Folks that attended, thank you for attending, and we hope you benefited from today's webcast. I'm going to mention it one more time to you all. Please do know that we do have tickets left and a good price for you all for our TOC conference in New York, February 12th through the 14th. You can still save on your registration. We pushed out details to you all. Might have just opened for you in another window as well. So please do take advantage of that. Haig will be speaking, doing his workshop. We have a lot of other workshops as well. So if you're interested in publishing and digital books and all that good stuff, you don't want to miss that conference. Again, thank you, Haig. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.